green fairy. The green muse. The green oblivion. These aren't just Kermit the Frog's alter egos as a street magician. They're also the nicknames for the most exotic and mysterious of all alcoholic spirits, absinthe. Once banned throughout the United States and much of Europe due to its association with addiction and insanity, the beverage has made something of a global comeback. Today on Weird History Food, we're looking at some fascinating facts and anecdotes about every poet's booze of choice, absinthe. But before we have a drink, be sure you're subscribed to the Weird History Food channel. And leave us a comment letting us know what other types of hooch you would like to hear about next. Okay, time to pour some weird history over a special fancy spoon. Absinthe is derived from the flowers and leaves of the Artemisia absinthium plant, also known as Grand Wormwood. It's then flavored with the leaves of another plant, green anise, along with sweet fennel and other culinary and medicinal herbs. But not eleven. That's the kernel's bit. It's particularly potent compared to similar spirits, with anywhere from 45 to 75 percent alcohol by volume. Now that is a party. Because it's so potent, absinthe is often diluted with water before being consumed. It's believed that the first absinthe spirits were produced in Switzerland in the late 18th century. The wormwood plant, though, has been consumed by humans for its medicinal properties dating all the way back to ancient times. There are papyrus documents from ancient Egypt, potentially composed as early as 3500 BCE, which describe using wormwood to treat intestinal parasites. And in ancient Greece, women who were giving birth chewed wormwood to ease their labor pains. In fact, the term absinthe is thought to derive from the Greek word absinthion, which means undrinkable. Huh, undrinkable. Would you like to bet on that? Oh, I like that! Rather than meaning that it's too gross to drink, this might reflect wormwood's utility for certain medicinal issues, like purging the digestive system, discouraging babies from breastfeeding when it was time to wean them. Of course, it would presumably also get those babies feeling pretty good about weaning. Absinthe drinking has long been associated with artists and creatives, most specifically with the French Impressionist painters of the 19th and 20th centuries, probably because it's an extremely fussy drink. And there is no one fussier than artists. Artists including Edouard Manet and Edgar Degas not only enjoyed the drink in their personal lives, but featured it prominently in their work. Degas L'Absinthe, which features a depressed-looking woman sitting in a cafe who's been served a glass of absinthe, today ranks among the artist's most iconic and recognizable works. But it sparked a mix of disdain and derision from critics upon its 1876 debut. They considered it degraded and uncouth, and in some cases declared its subject matter immoral, like he'd painted a portrait of a woman staring at a can of Four loco. Manet's 1859 portrait, The Absinthe Drinker, featuring a disheveled Parisian alcoholic rag salesman, received a similar response, and was near unanimously rejected when the artist submitted it to the French Salon. Manet's own mentor, Thomas Couture, supposedly questioned whether his protégé had lost his moral faculty upon first seeing the image. No, nah, man, he was just really into absinthe. A 2004 paper from the University of Kansas Medical Center cited absinthe consumption as a source for some of his psychological troubles of iconic artist Vincent van Gogh. Author Wilfred Niels Arnold suggests Van Gogh's likely absinthe habit, which would have been in line with the cultural trends of his era, fueled the downward trajectory of his depression. Arnold specifically argues that Van Gogh may have been addicted to thujone, a toxic chemical that's found in absinthe as well as substances like kerosene, turpentine, and paint. If you subscribe to this theory, Van Gogh's infamous habit of eating his own paints may have been a way to feed his absinthe addiction. The theory has drawn criticism from Dutch art historian and Van Gogh biographer Jan Hulsker, who denies that the artist was addicted to absinthe. Instead, Hulsker believes the artist kept the drink around and featured it in several of his paintings purely as decoration, though he may have occasionally indulged and been particularly sensitive to its effects. You know how people love to keep bottles of liquor around for decoration. 
At least some of the appeal of absinthe, particularly to modern drinkers, is its tantalizing dark reputation, which depicts the drink as immoral and potentially dangerous. When a lot of Americans think about absinthe, accurately or not, they're picturing careless bohemians gone half-mad and having wild visions on the stuff, like people at an old-timey rave. The notion that it's easy to slip from casual absinthe drinking into desperate addiction is a cautionary tale, of course, but also gives it a kind of shadowy appeal. It's the bad boy of alcoholic beverages. It should have a sleeve of tattoos or a mustache. Much of this negative perception stemmed from the work of 18th century French psychiatrist Valentin Magnon, who served as physician-in-chief at Sainte Anne, one of the country's largest facilities for the mentally ill. Over his 32-year residence at Sainte Anne, Magnon documented the effects of addiction to all manner of drugs and substances, but he saved his harshest condemnations for absinthe. Magnon blamed the drink for an overall spike in alcohol use and mental illness and also argued that it was triggering a decline in French culture. Huh, always thought that was French bread pizza. In a widely publicized experiment, Magnon exposed a group of animals to alcohol and other animals to wormwood oil. When the subjects exposed to wormwood developed seizures at a higher rate than those given alcohol, he concluded that the drink was responsible for a rise in overall French epilepsy rates. His work led to a wider study of what was sometimes called absinthism which was viewed as a separate and distinct diagnosis from more generalized alcoholism. Symptoms were thought to include restlessness, confusion, delirium, hallucinations, and yes, seizures. Magnon also suggested that regular absinthe drinkers were more prone to irrational and violent behavior than their alcoholic counterparts. Which kind of makes sense. The only thing more dangerous than an unruly drunk is an unruly drunk having visions. However, there's not a lot of practical, peer-reviewed, and replicable evidence to suggest that absinthe use was responsible for most of these conditions, and in fact its hallucinatory properties have long been overstated and exaggerated in pop culture. Still, Magnon wasn't the only member of the medical and scientific community dogpiling on the drink throughout the second half of the 19th century. Absinthism was included as an illness in the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal, a precursor to the New England Journal of Medicine. A separate study from a student of Magnon's observed a reddish tint in the urine of some seizure patients, and concluded that this was a chemical buildup in the body triggered by excessive absinthe consumption. Or maybe they just got punched in the kidneys during a bar fight. Many of these far-fetched ideas about the drink's potency and lingering effects were seemingly confirmed by an infamous crime in the rural Swiss town of Communi. Around the turn of the 20th century, absinthe drinking was on the upswing throughout much of Europe, due in part to its affordable price. Then, in 1905, a Swiss peasant named Jean Lanfray got drunk on a combination of absinthe, wine, and at least three other liquors before whacking his pregnant wife and their two children, and then shooting himself. Although he was apparently so drunk that he missed. When police arrived at the scene, they found Lanfray not only still alive, but fully conscious. He was later put on trial and convicted, only to successfully off himself in jail just three days after his arrival. The case became an international sensation that the press dubbed the Absinthe Murders, and it made the drink so notorious, Switzerland banned its consumption entirely by 1910. By that same year in France, annual absinthe consumption had increased to around 36 million liters, or 95 million gallons roughly enough absinthe to fill 150 Olympic-sized swimming pools. That's a lot of synth. Arguments similar to Magnon's that blamed the drink's popularity for decline in French culture and society became more popular in the press. The absinthe trend was also anecdotally implicated in a number of other French social problems of the era, including declining birth rates, an outbreak of tuberculosis, and an uptick in both violent crime and suicide. And to be fair, the drink did not have an alibi for that tuberculosis outbreak. The onset of World War I eventually gave the French temperance movement the ammunition it needed to pass a full national ban. New recruits attempting to sign up for the French army at the start of the war were failing medical exams at an unprecedented rate. By some counts, around 20% of the volunteers were deemed unfit for military service. Those aren't good numbers. When the blame was placed on excessive absinthe drinking, public sentiment decidedly shifted against the drink, and it was nationally banned by 1915. 
By that point, France was one of the last countries in Europe to outlaw absinthe. Whether or not absinthe was ever fully criminalized in the U.S. actually remains somewhat debatable due to the specifics of the law. Absinthe, the drink, was never specifically subject to a ban in the U.S. Instead, it was illegal to possess products containing thujone, the potentially toxic chemical found in absinthe that was blamed for Van Gogh's madness. Because, you know, it probably wasn't all that paint he was eating. Any product that contained thujone at a rate of more than 10 parts per million was banned from sale or distribution in the U.S. While some older studies suggested that absinthe contains up to 250 parts per million, amateur microbiologist Ted Bro has performed some experiments on vintage American absinthe and found that it's more like five parts per million. That would technically mean that absinthe had been legal all along, making the 2007 push to decriminalize it in the U.S. sort of unnecessary. But hey, I guess it's good to know for sure. The bands naturally led some undaunted enthusiasts to experiment with different absinthe alternatives in an attempt to replicate the same sweet, dizzying effects, sometimes with particularly bad results. Like that synthetic weed you used to be able to buy at gas stations. Yeah, you should not do that. Still, rumor has it that in the 1940s and 50s, some brave explorers combined gin with the pesticide dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane, also known as DDT, in a cocktail known as a Mickey Slim that approximated the effect of drinking absinthe. It also approximated the effect of drinking pesticide and a pretty effective wrestling move. While today we know that DDT is very dangerous for humans to consume, leading to some of the very same symptoms Dr. Magnon blamed on absinthe. In the 1950s, it was seen as mostly harmless, like smoking in hospitals. So drinking a gin and pesticide cocktail didn't seem quite as outlandish an idea as it would today. It smells really good. Nonetheless, there's not a lot of hard primary source evidence that many people really did drink Mickey Slims, even back in their supposed heyday. It might have never actually happened. Boy, let's hope so. That's not a hangover anyone needs to experience. Another legend claims that absinthe was partly responsible for the British loss in the Battle of New Orleans during the War of 1812. British troops invading the city were repelled by American forces, led by future President Andrew Jackson and sailing ships provided by French pirate and privateer Jean Lafitte. The story goes that Jackson and Lafitte worked out their negotiation to join forces during a secret meeting over the familiar green beverage. In exchange for a full pardon for Lafitte and all his men, he provided Jackson with access to his fleet. And let's face it, the story about Andrew Jackson getting hammered isn't exactly the most difficult legend to believe. The specific location for Jackson and Lafitte's drinking session is the subject of some local controversy down in the French Quarter. The city's old absinthe house long laid claim to being the original site of the agreement. But in 1951, a nearby bar called Maspero's Exchange filed a lawsuit claiming the meeting had actually taken place under their roof and argued that they should get a historical plaque of their own. The case was ultimately dismissed, with the judge declaring, legend means nothing more than hearsay or story handed down from the past. In other words, make your own plaque if it makes you feel better. And with so many tales about the history of drug use in America, it's pretty hard to nail down actual evidence for a lot of these stories. It's very possible that some, if not all, of our major cultural myths about absinthe use and its replacements are apocryphal. But whatever the case, absinthe remains the mysterious green drink preferred by artists and edgelords everywhere. So what do you think? Would you ever try absinthe? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're at it, check out some of these other great weird history food videos.